Okay, is everybody ready to start on the patient assessment? All right, so first thing is, what is a patient assessment? Why do we need to do it? Okay, hold on. Somebody's got to raise their hand. Go ahead. Uh, a patient assessment should review on the patient getting history from stuff like that, whether it be observational or not. Um, you know, why would you do it? Because mm -hmm. that's kind of like uh, we need to, to help the patient. You can't help the patient if you don't know what's going on. Yes. And so I tell y'all this, and I'm not kidding. I could bring my 11-year-old in here, and she could show you how to do an assessment. She can show you how to put an oxygen tank together. She can, she can go through a lot of this because my kids come up here and they help, right? Um, they'll sometimes play patients when we get to the pediatric stuff and, and, and like that. But they're very interested. The idea behind that is it doesn't matter what I know how to do. If I don't know how to do an assessment, every bit of tools I've got or every bit of skills I've got is only as strong as my assessment. Right? It doesn't matter what I can do. If I can't do a strong assessment, it's useless. Okay? So there are some phases of patient care that we're going to talk about. Review of dispatch information. Now, this happens all the time, ongoing, because you may get updated dispatch information, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Scene survey. You have your primary survey, your history taking, secondary survey, reassessment, communication, and documentation. These are all phases of patient care. Okay, so if you should have a test or quiz question, phases of patient care, this is what they're talking about, right? All right, <clears throat> why is the order of a patient assessment important? So priorities, what comes first? I know, well, that would be the order, right? The order tells me what comes first, but why? Why is it important what comes first? Hang on. Like, if you're complaining about a broken toe and you start noticing that they're going into some kind of reaction or something, you should probably take that as a reaction first and then get off the like broken toe. So there are some things that are going to kill me a lot quicker. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'd go with that. Um, and then the next question, let's see, why is it necessary to develop a method of assessment and use that method on all patients all the time? That way you don't. Hang on. Ah. Sir. Well, do it. Hang on. That's exactly right. Because if I do it the same way every time, that's how I naturalize it, or it becomes second nature. Also, if I start skipping around, you forget stuff or you miss things. It is very important. Remember I told you guys, memorize your patient assessment sheet. Learn how to employ it as we go through this class. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, we're already starting that process if you've started learning this. Okay? And what were you saying about BSI, Melissa? Just like BSI and scene size up, it's on the beginning of all of our... Almost all of them, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So our patient assessment actually starts at scene size up. So that's where we're at and that's where we're going to start. Okay? So if you have your... Uh, anybody? Did anybody get their sheet out? Excellent. So you're able to follow along. Anybody else got their sheets out? Good. Okay. Okay. All right, so scene size up. This begins immediately when I receive the call. Okay? Yep. Even before I'm there, before I even get in my truck, I'm going to start assessing some things like location. Where am I going? What side of town am I going to? Right? Better yet, am I going to Golden Haven High Rise? Am I going to the 11th floor on Golden Haven High Rise? Or the Kyle Building? Guess why it's important to know? My stretcher don't fit in the elevator at the Kyle Building. Okay? It's a high rise. We don't have very many in Temple, but the stretcher doesn't fit. Even if it's collapsed, it doesn't fit. All right? So those are important things for me to already be thinking about. Okay? Um, incident. So is this a medical patient? Is it a trauma? Do I know if it's a medical or a trauma? Okay? And then injured or injuries. So do I have multiple patients? That's me. I'm sorry. Do I have multiple patients? Or what are their injuries? So if I'm going to Chili's and I've got multiple people with nausea, vomiting, uh, lightheadedness, right? That's kind of a different call than one person at a private residence or even a public building. 
Okay? So this is all stuff I need to be thinking immediately when the pager goes beep or your radio goes beep. Okay? I'm already thinking about my call. What am I going to get into? Right? What are some of the things I might need? That's really important. Okay? Um, say it's a location that I know. Say it's the Kyle building and it's August. And I know that there's a 350 pound patient that lives on the seventh floor in 701. And I get called out to 701 and I know that the elevator is broken. You think maybe I want to make sure I've got other assistants coming? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so, and then it continues in route. So as we continue to get further information from the dispatcher or from other units that are arriving or on scene, okay, so don't forget, my dispatcher is the only source of information that I have. So if I hear somebody is on scene there, I need to be talking to them. I need to find out what they've got and what's going on, okay? Um, and then I need to look for things like smoke. Now, if I pull up to a car accident, how do I know the difference between steam and smoke? Some smoke can be white, depends on what's burning. Not necessarily. Steam dissipates, smoke does not. Do you know what that means? Yeah, steam, steam will kind of go away, smoke doesn't. That's why you can see a fire from a long ways away. Okay, so smoke, fire, how about high lines? Um, railroads, water mains, what water's around the area? I need to be thinking about all this stuff on my way. Is it an industrial area? Temple has a pretty significant, a large industrial area here. Okay, so if I know if I'm going out to industrial, if I go to Wilson Art, if I'm going to some of those places, I need to be thinking, is this a hazmat situation? Kind of, do I need rescue three? Do I need, you know, to roll out a specialized hazmat unit? This is all things railroads. So what happens if it's a car and a train? I need to be thinking about hazmat and how many people and do we need to evacuate people and how far away do we need to be and what's my wind direction right how do I need to approach do I need to come I need to come from the uphill side so am I gonna have to reroute to get there you know wind direction wind speed those kind of things okay um, so once I get there now I'm just now at my call can you believe that I have thought about all this stuff or evaluated all this mess and I'm just now there. So now that I'm there, I need to look at my overall scene. And they give you a car accident because this is the perfect example. If you don't look around all areas of this accident, you will miss big important things or have the very big potential to miss big important things. Okay? So what are the locations of the victims? Okay? Um, how many do I have? Right? And we'll learn about MCI stuff <coughs> later. Okay? But these are things I need to be thinking of. And then possible mechanism of injury. And we'll learn about that as we get into trauma. We'll start talking about kinematics, right, which is kind of force of nature or forces that, that we can kind of suspect or predict injury patterns based on some of these mechanisms, all right? Um, and I'm going to look for hazards. Now, you can read it, but before you read it, okay, so if you read and stop, what are some of the hazards that you think we might encounter. Weather, weather absolutely weather. Crowds. Crowds is a big one. Traffic. Traffic. Mm -hmm. Fires. Metal, glass. Metal, glass, spills, so it's all slip problems, fire, chemicals, chemicals down power lines, terrain. people, terrain. Okay, did we get them all? Let's see. Crowds, yep. Hazardous material, yep. Down power lines, yep. Gas. Mm, that's something you don't notice, right? How many of you guys are familiar with Temple? You know, if you take Midway from Midway and I-35 and you're heading up into town, you know that nice big open field? You know, there's a big gas main right there. It comes up out of the ground. Oh, yeah. So if you hear about an accident there, that's probably something you need to be going, huh, is this a gas problem? What, how, what side of the road are they on, right? Where are we at? Sir? the so if you get off 35 and Midway, and you head up the big hill, up in front of Bonham Middle School, okay, before you get there. All right, so fire we got. We got glass and jagged metal. Stability of the environment, sure. And then traffic and environment. Absolutely. All right. So in what order do I need to be thinking scene safety? This is key, folks. First, it's me. Second, it's my partner. 
Thirdly, it's going to be bystanders, crowds, family. Fourthly, it's my patient. Why? Yeah, that shall not create more patients. But why does my patient come after bystanders? Yeah, you don't want to add more patients. So he's already hurt, sick, or broke. Maybe not. Okay? So yeah, you have to remember, thou shall not create more patients. Injured and, and, and dead rescuers don't help anybody. So me and my partner... Now I need to make sure bystanders and crowds are safe. And this is going to be ever-changing, right? Just because I have said, Sir, I need you to come right over here and I need you to sit down. And I'll be with you in just a minute. I don't want you to walk out into the highway. I need you to come over here to this grassy area where it's nice and safe for you. I will be right back. Right? And I come back over to take care of the woman that's in the car. And guess what? She was on the phone with her husband. Naturally. So guess who shows up? Guess who's walking right into the traffic? Absolutely. So this is something that we have to think of all the time. Okay? All the time we have to be aware. Okay? Um, so do we need any additional resources? Yep. Do we need other EMS units? So that's where that number of patients comes into play or mechanism of injury. Right? What happened? Do I need other people? Law enforcement? Do I need traffic control? Is this a hostile situation? Right? Is this a domestic? Do I have a, lot, a big crowd? that I'm concerned about. Even if this wasn't from a domestic or a hostile situation, anytime you get crowds together and emotions are heightened, and guess what? When EMS is there, emotions are heightened. Okay? Anytime I have those kind of conditions, I have the potential. So law enforcement's always a good idea in those situations. And that includes family reunions, probably more so than anything else. Okay? Um, fire department, hazmat. How about a negotiating team? Does Temple have... They have a SWAT team, and their SWAT team handles all that. They do high-risk warrants. They do lots of different situations. Okay, So know your resources. That's another big thing. you got to know your resources before we even get into all this, right? Okay, can you guys think of anything else that you might need? Okay. Okay. How about TXU? Yeah. The gas company, yeah. right? Yeah. If we got a, if we got a problem with a, with a gas main or power lines down, we definitely need to be calling some extra resources. Okay. So body self isolation. What do I need? Gloves all the time. Are they the right gloves? Depending on the job I'm here to do, right? So if I work for an agency that I'm an EMT and a firefighter, if I'm a firefighter first, then my little latex or vinyl gloves aren't going to help me out. I need to have appropriate gloves. Okay. Um, eye protection, yes, always. Mask and gown, some of this is typically going to depend on what I'm going to. Right? How about protective clothing? How many of you guys are from Texas originally? Oh, my. So dress in layers. That's how you stay warm. Layers, layers, layers. Okay. Um, turnout gear. This is that whole head-to-toe protection. This is from your helmet to your goggles to your turnout coat to your rescue gloves to your bunker pants, boots, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Um, and then proper gloves for the job we already talked about. Um, protective clothing. <coughs> Helmets. You walk into an area and you notice, um, you ever heard that song, one of these things is not like the other one, right? If you're the one that looks different, Everybody around you is wearing like a hard hat? Probably need to stop and you need to get a hard hat on. Or you need to go, you need to bring the patient to me. Okay? So be aware of some of those things. Hey, is there is there a risk here? Oh, no. Why are you all wearing helmets? Well, because our job says we have to. They say you have to because it's a safety thing, so I need a helmet too. Okay? That's how it works. Um, boots, we did talk about how they need to be, when we talked about uniform, I think. Um, they need to be protecting your feet. Okay? They need to be flexible, comfortable. You're going to be in them for a while, all right? So be aware of some of those things. Um, eye and ear protection. This is going to be based on kind of your rescue ops and what you're doing. A long time ago, they didn't know you needed to wear ear protection whenever you um, worked rotor wing. 
who worked in the helicopter. Now they know you definitely have to have ear protection, and some of the vibration even from rotor wing can actually cause hearing loss as well. Okay? Um, sun protection. If you're going out to cover a special event, you do the boat. One of our guys does the boat races up in, I guess it's Dallas. I don't know. Somewhere. You know, if you're going to be sitting out on a lake all day, make sure you have sun protection. It's a bad day when you have to call in for work tomorrow because you got such a bad sunburn, you, you can't hardly stand it to sit, okay? Just thinking. Think ahead. Um, still on the scene, size up. Violent situations can be anything plus <laughs> civil disturbances, domestics. Now, look, I don't care if the wife called you because the boyfriend was knocking the crap out of her. The minute she he gets put in handcuffs, she wants to fight everybody defending him. Don't believe me? Wait, you'll see. They throw, I'm, I'm just telling you, okay? So be aware, domestic disturbances or disputes, even though she's the one who called and he's going to jail, be aware, okay? Any crime scene and, of course, large gatherings we already talked about, okay? Um, behavioral emergencies. Who? Oh. Behavioral emergencies are kind of this whole different monster, and we're going to talk a lot about that under the, um, is it special patient? No? Is it special patients that we talk about that? Okay. Um, so some of the things that are kind of, kind of determine violence is their past history. Here, and actually every, um, every place I've worked, I, we had very good working relationship with the, with the police that were there. So typically if the police hear the call go out or the dispatchers, because every time you call 911 to an address, it kind of gets banked in the system. So typically if the dispatcher sees that we have regular calls there and they're for violence, they will also notify the PD and go, hey, look, there's an EMS call at this address. Again, if dispatchers are familiar, PD is probably pretty familiar. They're really good about rolling out, okay? So past history is a good one. Um, how about posture? If you can't read a scene and you can't read somebody's posture, you've got a lot of work ahead of you for this course. Okay? But well, what do I mean by posture and the difference in violence? How, how they're looking. Usually someone's like they're a little relaxed. They're very easy going. Usually somebody who's agitated and sees some hand movements, twisting the hands, sees some of their eyes, they'll come looking around, looking at the animalistic man. And those folks are a little bit more scary because they're the ones that you can't quite predict as well. So they have a higher tendency to do. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Fist clenching is one of the big ones, guys. So if, if they're standing here like this, they're probably closed off. I'm not thinking they're going to be violent because nobody can react real quickly. You know what I'm saying? They're closed off. They're mad. When they drop their hands and you watch them make a fist, it's time to create a buffer zone. That's time to back up and give yourself a little extra room. Make sure you know where your exits are and make sure that somebody doesn't get between you and your exit. Okay? This is a good idea to keep in mind anytime we go on these calls. Any call. Always know a way out. Okay? Always. Um, my vocal activity, sure. Now, some people scream and yell when they're mad, right? You guys know people like that? How many of you guys are screamers? Nobody else screams and yells when they're angry? Oh, I get, I get straight up mad. How many of you are scrappers? Yes. How many of you know people who fight? People who tend to have this violent behavior? How many of them get real quiet? That's right. That's right. So the person that's screaming and yelling, I'm like, okay. Once they clist their finches and they're screaming and yelling, yeah, maybe I need to back up a little bit more. So now they're real quiet and they're pacing. It's a whole different ball game. You see, I'm already moving towards the door. Yeah, yeah, I watch temples and their jaws because you can see when they start gr biting their teeth, you know, they'll start. Yeah. So, guys, this is all part of our patient assessment, right? I mean, we're assessing everything, and this is very important. Not only on my patient, but what about the people around the scene, right? So, suppose I have, I have the little old woman... In the question, she's having a stroke. Wasn't that the question? No, no. But she's having a stroke, and and son's going to take her, and dad's saying no. Now I'm going to take this woman because really, dad can't even tell me no. Does he have the potential to become a hazard, or to be one of these people? Yeah, absolutely. So you still need to keep an eye on, right? Keep an eye on these people. Okay. 
And their physical activity, again, if they're pacing, that's like a cat on the prowl, right? You guys see them. You know what I'm talking about, okay? So watch those. Um, your personal safety is of the utmost importance. I think we kind of talked about this significantly. Above all else, I go home to my family. That's the end-all, be-all answer. Above all else, I go home to my family. Because somebody wants you to come home. Sir? So if they, someone does, like, try to attack you, is it legal to... No, no. You can get out of the situation. You do not have the right because that's false imprisonment. You are not a police officer. You cannot. You can't do that to somebody. So, but you can, like, so if they come at you, you can defend yourself. Can you? Go away. If they get that close, you've already failed. I'm going to tell you that right now. If they, if you were in that position, you've probably already failed, unless they're in the back of your ambulance. So yes, I mean, you have the right to defend yourself. That doesn't mean that they go down and you continue. I mean, and can you be, and again, can you be brought, can they bring charges against you? Yes, they can. That is up to the, to the judge or the jury or whomever to determine if you were justified or if you weren't. I mean, that, there's no cut and dry answer there. It, it, there just isn't. Say again? Like maybe like in a crowd situation, maybe police saying like, you got PD there, but they somehow get around you or something. Like you get in between. I'm telling you that if you go blow to blow with this guy and don't make the opportunity to exit, uh, you, are, you are in uh, more, I, I would be less likely to think you have a good position when you do go to court. Okay? Well, uh, <laughs> that it's not. Okay? And it, so it really is important to understand that no matter what kind of situation you're in, you are not without risk. I, and that's, that's the thing of this job, right? You guys know all what happened at the ER not very long ago. No. Yeah. A man came in with a gun and held, held the ER hostage, and he was shot and killed in the ER. That's one of the first and only time, and most hospitals have had an issue like that. They've had people walk into an ICU and shoot their wife and shoot themselves because they're putting her out of her misery and they can't stand to live with, you know, I mean. I'm not in Memorial in Waco. Memorial's here. I mean, I'm just saying that, that, that it happens less frequently at the hospital because it's a more controlled environment. They have more control of their environment than we do. Remember, we are being implanted in people's environments. So it's really important to understand not only the current risk, but the risk that could develop based on what I'm doing right here. Okay? All right, so now we're going to start our primary assessment. Just now, we're going to start our primary assessment. Okay? So if you're following along, are you with me on your checkoff sheet? You know where your primary assessment is? Those of you who had it out? Okay. Um, so what are we going to do here? This is to find and fix life threats. That is the entire point of the primary assessment, find and fix life threats. Okay? Um, and then identify those patients who need rapid um, evacuation. So this is, I'm going to decide who can I kind of stay in play and do some stuff on scene and who do I need to be working on the way to the truck and working a lot when I'm in the back of the truck. Okay? That's the primary assessment. Okay? Um, and this is, the way to remember it, is A, B, C, D, E. D and E are flexible. A, B, C are not. Okay? And we're going to get into each one of those. Um, primary survey. This is my general impression. What does the patient look like? So as I'm approaching from across the room, what do they look like? Are they stable? Are they potentially unstable? And we're going to talk about some of the visualizations that I'm going to look for some of the things that I want to get feedback on as I'm approaching to kind of get some of these ideas, okay? What's their level of consciousness? Do they look at me when I walk in the room? Do they track me as I'm coming across the room? Are they kind of out of it, right? Are they checked out, like awake and nobody's home kind of thing, okay? Are they just laying there unresponsive, okay? So those are some of the things that I'm looking at as my primary survey, okay? Um, what's my mental status? This is part of my primary assessment. My mental status is AVPU, A -V -P -U, 
So are they alert? Do they respond to verbal stimulus? So if you're just kind of sitting there with their eyes open or closed, right? And I have to go, DeMarco. And then he looks or opens his eyes or turns to me. He's responding, responding to verbal stimulus. He's not interacting with his environment. He's not walking. I mean, most of us would watch as somebody comes in the room, right? Don't believe me? What happened when they left? Yeah, everybody followed and tracked, right? What's going on? Is the building on fire? Okay. Um, are they responsive to painful stimuli? Now, this doesn't get to give you the right to be cruel. Okay, this really is an assessment of neurologic status. Okay, so some of the ways you can do that is you can pinch their clavicle, okay, or their trap. You can um, push on the nail bed, right? If you push hard enough, it hurts. Most people kind of use a pin. Or there's the sternal rub. Now, as a paramedic, I kind of go, do they move when I start the IV? Because if I walk in and they're unresponsive, I'm going to probably start an IV pretty quickly. So there are lots of ways to assess that. Do they respond to painful stimuli? For you guys, it's going to be, you're going to have to put hands on, you know, and do some stuff. Don't smack them and, okay, don't do, you laugh. But I'm telling you there are people out there who've done this kind of stuff, okay? Um, and then if they don't respond to anything, of course, they're unresponsive. So when, they, when I push on his nail bed, right, and I take his pen, and I push down hard on his nail bed, that is a withdrawal from painful stimulus. Hurts, doesn't it? Okay. There you go. <laughs> All right, he's awake now. But that's they can withdraw from pain. Maybe they just moan but don't withdraw. There's lots of different responses, but if they verbally moan, if they wake up, if they withdraw, that's all response to pain. If I do that and he doesn't move, you're like, wow, I know that. Did that? Did, it, did you do it hard enough? I don't know. Try again. Don't do that. Okay? So, remember, ab poop. Uh, introduce yourself to the patient, to the bystanders, etc. Right? And I can show you a primary assessment, and I can do my primary assessment in about 60 seconds or less, probably. Okay? It doesn't take a real long time if they're awake and interacting with me. Okay? Um, and then you're going to determine the chief complaint, and you treat while you assess. The hardest part about this patient assessment is because we have to teach it sequentially so you have to learn it in order but when we do this in real life we do multiple steps at the same time okay does that make sense all right um, so your primary survey there's this ABC assessment and then there's also a CAB uh, approach okay so if they have signs of life then I do ABC what this means um, is hey hey are you okay Right? Because that's what we do. That's our first thing. Remember CPR? Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, are you okay? And they don't say anything. So now I'm opening the airway. I'm look, listening, and feeling. So I'm going to assess the A's, B's, and then C's. So airway, is it open? Is it clear? B, are they breathing? C, do they have a pulse? Right? But if there's no signs of life, I'm going to assess A, B's, and C's. But I'm going to treat C before anything. Right? That's why we don't start bagging first with CPR. We go right into chest compressions. Okay? Once we've established that there's not signs of life on this patient. Okay? Does that make sense? Anybody confused by this? No? You with me? Okay. Jose? Good? Okay. All right. So my primary assessment. Again, I'm identifying life threats. So airway. Now, I need to determine... Um, is there a mechanism for C-spine? If I don't know, somebody's going to need to maintain C-spine, right? So I'm going to tell my partner, hey, can you maintain C-spine? Do it modified, and we're going to learn all about jaw thrust and head tilt chin lift and kind of different ways to manually open the airway, okay? So I'm going to open the airway, and then I'm going to clear it and maintain it. So clearing could mean suction. If there's secretions and vomit in the airway, I need to clean it out, right? If they're bleeding into their airway... I may need to continue to go back and revisit that suction. Okay, so don't think that one time is it and I'm done. You have to you have to continuously do this. Okay, so open, clear, and maintain. All right, uh, is the patient able to talk? All right, if they're able to talk, do they are they hoarse? Okay, how do they sound when they talk? Are they talking real quiet because they don't get much air? They're not able to. Okay. Um, or are there sounds? Can I hear sounds from across the room? Strider, is this 
crowing noise, or uh, sometimes it sounds like a wheeze or a whistle, heard on in inhalation, okay? And that indicates an upper airway obstruction, okay? Or a partial upper airway obstruction. Are they gurgling? Y'all know what gurgling sounds like, okay? That's fluid in the airway. We need to suction those people, okay? Um, and then there are several others that we're going to learn about um, from across the room. Uh, how about, are they coughing? What does it sound like when they cough? Okay? Um, and then correct problems before proceeding. Okay? So if they're not breathing, but they have vomit in their airway, what happens, Keaton, what happens if I don't check the airway that it's clear, but then I move on to B and they're not breathing, so I bag them. I use the BVM and it provide ventilation. What happens? Well, or down into the lungs, right? And, and that causes things like aspiration pneumonia, okay? I've just insured a hospitalization for my patient, long term, okay, or potentially long term. So I have to open and clear it. Once I do that, then I can go on, okay? Um, so position, you would be amazed at how many times position will fix an airway problem, okay? If they're sitting up and they're unresponsive and they're like this, okay, all the oxygen in the world isn't going to matter if you don't open their airway. Say again? Yeah. And, and I'm not picking on the nursing homes. Guys, you're going to go to that call. You're going to go to the low O2 sats, patients not responding appropriately, and they have them sit up in a chair and their head is dropped down, their airway isn't open. Open the airway and give them some oxygen. And then take them to the hospital. Okay. Um, do they need an OPA or an MPA? And we're going to learn more about that. Those are uh, oral pharyngeal airways and nasal pharyngeal airways. So if you've already started looking at your checkoff sheets, those are in the mech aids or mechanical aids to breathing checkoff sheets. Okay. Um, finger sweep. When do we do a finger sweep? Yeah. Only when you see it. And if it's like chunky vomit, suction ain't going to work. You might have to finger sweep it in. <laughs> Right? Depending on the thickness of it, you may or may not be able to suck it out. Okay? Excellent. Um, and then do your foreign body airway maneuvers. Okay? I see some looks. Everybody okay? Y'all doing all right? Sir? With the book that says snoring as well, um, yep. what kind of snoring are you talking about? Is snoring in general is a partial airway obstruction by the tongue. And the tongue is the number one cause for airway obstruction in unresponsive patients. Right. Or head irritation. So any kind of snoring is the airway obstruction? Yep. That's going to be that OPA or MPA. You'll learn a little bit more about that. They kind of pull the tongue up off the airway. Okay? So you all heard that, right? Snoring. How many of you guys snore at night? Okay. That's a partial airway obstruction because your tongue is in the way. You'd be amazed at how many times if you change position. So does your wife bump you and you roll over and quit snoring? Okay. You've changed position. Your tongue is no longer in your airway. Okay? Now breathing. Now we're going to look, listen, and feel. All right? Is it deep enough? And what's the rate? We can estimate the rate. Like, look, I, I know if I walk in and they're, that's too fast. <laughs> All right? However, if I kind of go, is she breathing? That's probably too slow. Okay? Are you with me? So you can kind of look. You don't have to go, it is 20 and okay. However, when you're in here and you're doing your patient assessment, you do need to know enough about the breathing to determine what type of oxygen maneuvers you're going to do. What kind of, what type, what liter flow, how you're going to deliver it. Does that make sense? So that's, when it says estimate the number, you can do that. All right? But you got to get this whole picture. Okay? Um, bear the chest if they're in respiratory distress or if you can tell that they're having trouble breathing. We need to make sure. Right? We are going to look, listen, and feel. Okay? Discreetly, of course. All right? Um, and then you also need to listen to breath sounds. If they're in respiratory distress, you need to listen to breath sounds. Let me tell you, breath sounds are not an easy feat. Okay? It is difficult. Everybody is going to sound different. How many of you guys bought a stethoscope for this class? Okay? 
I'm not being funny. I'm telling you, everybody who will let you, I mean, don't stand in line at Walmart and stuff. Because that would creep me out a little bit. I'd be like, dude. Actually, I would probably go, no, try listening here. <laughs> okay? But you need to listen. And so get your stethoscopes out. Practice vital signs and, and breath sounds on everybody. Okay? On your family, on your friends. Okay? The only way to get better at those things is practice. Okay? But it is appropriate if they have a respiratory distress or a respiratory complaint to assess those breath sounds as part of my ABC assessment. Okay? If they don't have a respiratory component, you may or may not have to even listen. Okay? If I'm calling you for abdominal pain, oh, okay, that's a bad example. If I'm calling you because i got a broken leg, probably don't need to listen to my lung sounds right now. Okay? All right. Now we're going to go to circulation. You must say, what is it? What does your checkoff sheet say? It's actually, there's a little star by it. So as you're looking at your checkoff sheets, if it's got a star by it and you don't do it, that's a critical failure. That means you could hit every single thing else, but if you don't go, do I see any major bleeding or I'm going to assess for major bleeding? Don't say that or don't do those two steps. It's a critical failure if it's appropriate for your patient. Okay? It's not going to be appropriate for every patient, but if it's appropriate and you don't say it or do it, okay, it's a critical failure. Right? Um, so then we're going to assess for pulse. Location and rate. Now, what do I mean by location? Where are they? I mean, carotid, radial, brachial, femoral, right? Typically, the ones we use the most are the carotid and the radial, all right? And we're going to learn about... Um, perfusion later, right? Because there's a way you can kind of estimate the blood pressure, but what we're really checking here is perfusion. So if I have a patient that's unresponsive, two things I'm going to assess when I go to assess pulses, I'm going to assess do they have a radial and do they have a carotid. No radial but a carotid, my patient's really sick, okay? If they have a radial, I got some time to work, right? So you will learn about some of those signs and what they mean and the differences, okay? But it's important not only to know what you're assessing like the rate, but where do you find it? Because you can have a carotid pulse at a rate of 100 and not have a radial pulse. Okay? Um, and we also need to look at skin color and temperature and capillary refill. Now, capillary refill is really good on pediatrics um, as long as they're in an environment that, that's uh, appropriate temperature. Okay? Um, you do need to assess it. Okay? Does everybody know how to assess capillary refill? Okay, so you can do a couple of things. See how my hand is pink? And I push on it, see how it blanches or turns white? Now I let up, how many seconds does it take to go back pink? Okay? Okay, it should be two or less. Okay? You can also assess it here on the nail bed. Everybody look. Everybody assess it. Know what you're looking for. Okay? Pediatric patients, you may want to assess a peripheral cap refill and a central cap refill. Okay, centrally on pediatrics is a very good place to check. Okay, um, skin color and temperature. Now, obviously, if it's 3 o'clock a.m. and they're on their way home from grandmama's house on Christmas Eve and they've been laying in the ditch for two hours, their capillary refill, even if they're not in shock or having significant compromise, can be slow because of the temperature. Okay. So when we start talking about, oh, they're cold to the touch and their cap refill is, okay, yes, but are they ambient temperature? So if I find that patient in December who's been laying outside for a while, yes, even here in, temp uh, in Texas, versus the person that's outside in 90 degree weather who's cool to the touch, okay, those are very different, okay? But you need to know, you still need to assess it even if it's cold out or, you know, the temperature is kind of might skew your results. Okay, because you're not looking for a single sign. We're looking for the big picture. All of these are our little Lego pieces that we're using to build our castle or our ship or whatever it is that you do. Okay, so that's what you got to remember is each one of these is a little Lego piece and it all fits into that patient assessment that you're looking at. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, we already talked about capillary refill. Skin color can be pale, ashen, cyanotic, mottled. Who knows what mottled is? What's mottled? 
see a lot of young children. They kind of, you kind of see like the veins coming out and you get like little patches of blue and white. It looks like marbled, doesn't it? Yeah, marbled is kind of a good way to describe it. Okay, and that usually happens on the arms and legs um, if they're cold and little kids. Um, flushed is just red. What's cyanotic? Blue. Where do we typically see cyanosis? Nail beds, lips, eyes. Come up here, Patrick. Jeremiah, come on up here. Oh no, stay right there, face everybody. And I'm not picking on y'all, please don't think that. Okay. But you were the um, lightest complected person I could find in the room, I think. Okay? So when I look at when I look at Jeremiah here, how do I know if that's his normal color or if he's pale? No, pale is different. So they could have pallor or paleness, which is just this white color. Doesn't mean cyanosis. Those are very different. Look at his lips. His lips are pink, right? That would kind of tell me this is probably his normal color, right? Y'all with me? Yes. On Patrick here, what do you think? How do I know if Patrick is pale? If he's ashen? If he's pink, see the pink at his lips? You can also look at people's gums or everybody look at your partner. Pull down your eye and look. See how it's pink or red? Do it to each other. Okay? If it's pale, it will be like white. It's very difficult to find. Right? So look at people's gums. So those, those who are darker, darker complected, look at their gums. Look at under their eyes. Okay? And then compare it to their lips. Okay? That's how you tell. Is he pale or is he... Just Irish and don't tan well. Huh? Just Irish and don't tan well. <laughs> Just, uh, you don't have red hair. I bet you got red undertones. All right. That's all I needed, guys. So that's how you're going to tell, is he pale or is this like his, is he just a light, light complected? You've seen those people, right? Powder, how many of you guys seen the movie Powder? Yeah, what? I, I'm probably way too old to be in there. All right. So questions about the colors and where we're going to look to check for abnormalities. Um. You know what? Remind me before we go to break, and I will pull up a picture of modeling, okay. so that you can see. And we'll really, we really get into it when we start talking about pediatrics and the special patients lectures. Well, mm -hmm. go ahead. Have you ever had a before? I haven't. I haven't. But most of the time, they'll tell you. And um, uh, the big indicator would probably be their hair color and their eyebrows. Okay. That would that would probably be a pretty big indicator to me. Well, no, what I'm asking is like, would uh, the same symptoms still show up? I don't know how an albino person can look pale. I, I really don't. I would assume that they would still show cyanosis. And when you learn a little more about cyanosis, you're probably... Okay. Okay. Um, not my primary assessment. Jonas indicates a liver condition. And it's usually probably pretty chronic. Um, so yeah, I want to note that they're jaundiced, but that's not part of my, that's not going to be a big screamer for me unless they're having abdominal pain, she's having night sweats, she's running a fever. Because it was probably a gradual onset. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, she's got a liver problem. They're, yeah, they're definitely yellow. Okay. Um, so again, check skin temperature. Are they hot, warm, or ambient temperature, right? So it's kind of like in the area. Um, or are they cool? And then we also got to check skin condition. So are they moist? Are they dry? When we talk skin turgor, who knows what skin turgor is? No. Skin turgor is 
and, and we call it sometimes tenting. When we talk about turgor, I want to know how elasticity, you know, what's the elasticity like? So if I pinch it up and they have poor skin turgor, it'll tent. That's what we call tenting, except for unless the elderly, because the elderly kind of will automatically show those signs anyway, right? But if I pinch this up and it stays there, that's a poor sign. That's a poor skin turgor. Okay? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, disability is their level of responsiveness. So all I said, this is fluid. Of course we're going to do this, right? This is part of that, hey, hey, are you okay? Right? As I'm messing with people, I will realize whether they're unresponsive, respond to painful, that whole ABPU scale. Okay? Um, also, expose. This is head, neck, chest, and abdomen. Um, and it's going to depend on the conditions. Okay? So if I'm an unresponsive patient, yes, I need to I need to expose, I need to inspect. Okay? That's only if A, B, C is either stable, controlled, or maintained by me or by them. Does that make sense? So if they're not breathing, right, I'm going to be bagging them. Okay? That's controlled for right now. Now I'm going to look and go, do I see anything on the chest that's causing them to not breathe? Does that make sense? My first thing is correct the problem. Okay? Um, and again, it's going to depend on reasoning. Okay? If they're having abdominal pain, probably need to look and see why they're having abdominal pain. All right? Um, if you find a problem, fix it, then move on. That doesn't mean fix it as in they're not breathing, I've got to make them breathe for themselves. No. I'm fixing it when I breathe for them. Right? That's part of fixing. If I find a problem with the airway, don't get airway and breathing confused. Don't skip over, don't go, oh, airway, breathing, are they breathing, and I'm going to bag them. We're going to have to actually assess the airway. Again, are they talking to me? Because that will make a big difference, right? If I come in and go, sir, my name is Heather, I'm a paramedic, I'm here to help you, what's going on today? I already have done my complete ABC assessment. He's alert, he tracks me, he's, that tells me he's got sugar and oxygen to the brain, I've assessed his pulse, it's strong, regular, within normal limits and he's not having any trouble breathing. Okay? So on one of the, on, on a patient who's up and talking to me and not having any significant distress, that's a whole ABC assessment. If he's sick, I'm going to have to spend a little bit more time. Okay? Um, still in the primary. Uh, what's their priority? So are they stable? Do they need rapid transport? Okay? Can I stay here and play? Are they unstable or potentially unstable? What do you mean by stable? Like mentally or? No. <laughs> oh, no. Mental stability has a completely different chapter. No. Right. No, sir. Um, I'm talking about ABCs. Not even bottles. ABCs. Okay? So, are they stable or not? His? Very stable. Thank you. Right? <laughs> okay. So, AC, so, maybe I need to put on oxygen. Is it still stable? Sure. Oh. If they're breathing 48 times a minute and they're using accessory muscle use and he's working hard and I can hear noises from across the room, he's potentially unstable. So he could go unstable any minute. While I'm very comfortable handling him right now, I need to realize I need to be thinking two steps ahead of what my patient's probably going to do. Okay? Um, need for additional help. So do I need ALS? Take note it says ALS intercept. Okay? That means... Just because I go, I need ALS here, I want you to think outside the box. If I'm 10 minutes away from the hospital and ALS can't get to me for 15 minutes, I need to be moving, right? Or if I've got a 20-minute transport time, but it's going to take ALS 10 minutes to get here, I will rendezvous, intercept me en route, okay? That just means we're going to meet up somewhere. Because what happens? Now I've sat on scene for 20 minutes. I'm going to give them a report. They're going to kind of do what was stabilization that they need to do. And we still have 20 minutes to get to the hospital. How much time have I just wasted for my patient? Yeah, significant amount of time, unnecessarily. Okay? Uh, and then what's my transport decision? Is it rapid or, or immediate transport or can I go normal? So do I need lights and siren to transport or can I, can I go routine traffic? Okay? Um, some criteria for rapid transport. Poor general impression. So as I'm walking up, you look sick, but your ABCs are 
stable. I just can't quite put my finger on it. That's that potentially unstable. That's okay to rapid transport. Okay? Um, unresponsive, obviously. If they're unresponsive, they have an issue. Okay? They have an issue neurologically. All right? Especially if they have no gag or cough. So if you can put in an OPA, and we're going to talk more about this later, if you can put in an OPA, that is absolutely a rapid. They can't protect their airway. Okay? We'll talk more about that later. But the ability for a patient to protect their airway is paramount. All right? Um, if they're unresponsive, or I'm sorry, if they're responsive but unable to follow commands, again, neurologic, they have something going on. Okay? Or, well, that could be a lot of different things. Um, if you cannot establish and or maintain an airway. So the guy who ate his gun and pulled the trigger, right, and the blood is just going, you cannot maintain it, you can't maintain it because you can't suction, you know, it's bleeding faster than I can suction it out, that is a rapid transport, we got to go. Okay? Vomit, whatever the case may be. What if they didn't, he didn't shoot himself, what if he was a motorcycle and didn't wear a helmet? And now he's got massive facial trauma and I can't even see... You know, I can't put the mask on, I do, and I just feel mush. Okay, that's a problem. Um, difficulty breathing or respiratory distress is absolutely a rapid transport. Okay. Um, poor perfusion, so that means poor skin signs. If they have poor color, um, if they're the wrong temperature, okay, if they're cold, okay. So if they're running a fever, that's not necessarily poor perfusion. Okay. Um, Severe pain in any part of the body, it is not your pain, it is their pain. You don't get to determine that you don't think they're in enough pain. It doesn't work like that. Okay? I wholeheartedly, absolutely believe it is not my place to determine. Right? My 10 is a lot different than his 10. Than his 10. It's okay. All right? Um, uncontrolled bleeding. So, um, oh, I skipped that one, didn't I? Sorry. Um, severe chest pain, cardiac chest pain, okay, you're going to learn a little bit about how to differentiate some of these, okay, um, or inability to move any part of the body, all right, complicated childbirth, yeah, that's a load and go, okay, um, temperatures over 104 in infants, <coughs> excuse me, in newborns, <coughs> I believe it's anything over um, 100 is an emergency. Maybe 101, but 100. So if they are less than six weeks old and they have any fever, not for an infant, or not for a newborn, it's not. Okay, yeah, but for an infant, yes. But for a newborn, no. Um, signs of general hypothermia, uh, allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, and we're going to learn all about that stuff. Okay, um, positioning or poisoning or overdose. Um, and, and this says, of unknown nature, okay? I think that's fluid. So poisoning or overdose is need for a rapid transport, okay? Now, now we're at the history taking, okay? Those of you who are following along, are you with me? Do you know where we're at? Okay, because now we're kind of going into that secondary type assessment. So history taking, what's this for? We're going to determine kind of the chief complaint Right? And no, it may not be why they said I was going to the house. Right? You get there. Keep in mind, dispatchers who are on the phone have a set list of questions to ask. So if I'm having abdominal pain and my son calls for me and I'm, oh, oh, it hurts. And the dispatch operator says, how is she breathing? And he says, fast. Guess what? That just became a respiratory call. Okay? They ask some of those things by whoever's visualizing the patient, but they don't know the difference they're determining. So it is possible to get called out for a different reason than why the patient thinks you're coming. Does that make sense? Kind of like the it is the telephone game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, and it could be several middlemen that it has to go through by the time it gets to you. Um, so we need to kind of evaluate the condition. What what was kind of going on? We need to take in the whole the whole story, right? Not just you're having a hard time breathing, but maybe you know what were you doing when it started? Okay. Oh, I was running. Well, that's a little different than 
I was sitting here, I got up to go to the bathroom, and all of a sudden it hit me and I can't breathe. Okay? Those are very different. It doesn't mean any one is less important or more important than the other, but it does start leading me down some different pathways. Okay? Um, and then is the mechanism or injury high risk? So that we're going to learn about. Remember we talked about those patterns of injury or those mechanisms that cause certain kind of injuries. Okay? Um, components, you're going to get demographic data. Well, is this your house that I'm at type stuff? How old are you? More important, right? Um, history of present illness or HPI, okay? That's, I'm not worried that you had your appendix taken out when you were seven, okay? I want to know about today, all right? Um, now I want to know past medical history, okay? We'll get there eventually. Um, and then current health status. So, oh yeah, I have high blood pressure. That's part of my past medical history, right? Well, are you taking your medicine? Did you take it today? If not, why aren't you taking it? How long have you been out of it? Okay, so we have a lot of different questions. Okay? Some. Some of them do. Yeah, some of them do. Um, yeah, but that may not even be updated. Yeah. Um, so demographic data age, gender, race, and you'll learn a little bit why race is important and even gender. So male versus female. Males having abdominal pain, probably abdominal pain. Elderly women having abdominal pain, probably a heart attack. Okay? You'll learn about it in a little bit. Um, and then history of present illness, what's their chief complaint, and what are their signs and symptoms? What is a sign? I don't mean stop. I mean, what is a sign? It's something you can observe and see, like you can see it in front Yeah, yeah. So this is something I see, I gather, I obsess. Like a vital sign, I assess that. What is a symptom? How are they different? Because it's very important to know the difference between a sign and a symptom. What is a symptom? So, right. So, okay. So if he says... I'm having trouble breathing. That is a symptom. I can see signs that support that. Rapid respiratory rate, increased work of breathing, accessory muscle use, right? I see those things. So those signs and symptoms kind of go together. You see how that works? No. Symptoms are what they tell you. Symptoms are what they feel. Okay. Signs are something you see or put your hands on. Okay. okay? So pain is a symptom because I can't see that. The cut is a sign. Um, past medical history. Take note, it says pertinent. Okay. How do we know what's pertinent and what isn't? Right. So is it something to do with what's going on today? Can it be a contributing factor? Sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, again, I had a tonsillectomy uh, when I was 18. If I'm calling you today because I can't breathe, probably not too pertinent. There you go. So pertaining to why I'm here today. All right? So, and that could be medical trauma or surgical. Primary example, I had a woman who had a fractured uterus. Okay? What that basically means is she actually split her uterus in a, in a, a car accident. Okay? So she had a weakened uterine wall. So when I go, because something fell out, okay, that was pertinent information that I needed to know. Because her bowel pushed through the opening in the uterus and caused her uterus to come out. Okay, so that trauma, that traumatic event was pertinent to what was going on today. Okay? Sure. Yeah. Oh, it's right side. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I can rule that out. I mean, I, it's less likely if they had, if they had an appy you know, years ago, and they're having right lower abdominal pain, I'm starting to think some other things rather than appendicitis. Yeah. But if she's, like, pregnant, that hurt. You know, she's having lower abdominal pain. 
Yeah, yeah. lower abdominal pain is always pertinent on women. All right. Um, so current health status, again, pertinent, focused on the present state of health, not, you know, my dad had diabetes when he was, uh, that's, that's nice, dear. What do you have going on today? I'm just kidding. Don't call them dear. Okay. Um, and what are their environmental conditions? And that does mean the environment that you find them in. Is this their house? And kind of, is that pertinent to what's going on? If I walk into a meth lab and they're having chest pain or respiratory breathing or respiratory distress, probably very pertinent. Okay, there's chemicals. All right, so some factors, medications, allergies, tobacco. So look around, do they have dip cans? Um, how about smoking? Do you see uh, lots and lots of cigarette butts and they're having complaints of trouble breathing, they're on oxygen, you go, honey, you know you're not supposed to smoke on oxygen. She said, oh, I wasn't smoking. <laughs> Excellent, okay. I had a patient that actually was smoking on oxygen with her face on fire and still tried to say I wasn't smoking. Oh, yeah, her fingers were burnt where she was holding her cigarette. She wasn't smoking. Okay? Um, drugs and related substances. Yeah, you're going to run into them. Um, what's their diet? Do they have immunizations? Now I want to know about family history. Family history is really important when we start talking about I'm 42, I'm having chest pain. Um, have you ever had this before? No, I haven't. Oh, okay, and you're thinking 42, that's young, right? My dad died at 40 from a heart attack. My brother's 45, and he had his first heart attack when he was 43. You know, my granddad died when he was 50. That is significant family history. That's pertinent to what's going on. Okay? Again, appendicitis, not so pertinent. If my dad had his appendix out, okay, that's nice. Okay? Um, and then travel history. Yes, travel history is important. Okay? Especially if they have trouble breathing or were they recently scuba diving when they went to Co? We just got home from Cozumel. Oh, great. Were you scuba diving? Yes, I was. Wonderful. How long was it before you got on the plane? Oh, four hours. Okay, we got a problem. Okay? Um, so techniques. Watch your personal space. Now, again, this is all about being able to read the situation. Right? I can walk in and tell by the position, the way they're sitting, the way they're looking at me, their behaviors, should I invade their personal space or not? That's one of the reasons I always come in and stick out my hand and go, Hi, I'm Heather, I'm a paramedic, I'm here to help you, right? I know, I, I, do they give me permission to enter their space? Are they okay with that? What's their, what's their mental status like, right? So now I've killed like seven birds with one stone. I'm just kidding, not seven, but a lot. Okay? I've really contributed to my assessment by doing that. Okay? Um, so watch uh, your demeanor and your appearance and your body language. Really important, okay? Especially when we start talking about dramatic things, those people who are unsuccessful at attempting to take their own life. It, there are some things, or in a car accident, when somebody's going, oh my God, am I going to be okay? And they haven't looked in the mirror, and you go, you're going to be fine. Try not to look horrified when you're looking at them. You say, I, I'm not kidding. When you sit in the back of an ambulance and it's dark outside, and you're sitting in that jump seat or that captain seat, guess what? Your image is reflected on that back window for, for the patients to see. Okay? So be very aware of your demeanor. Okay? Um, use, their pa use the name. Don't do the deer and the honey and the sweetie and the babe. Bra stuff. Okay? Go with it. Okay? It's a typo. You know what? That is now your nickname. Mr. Jeremiah. <laughs> Sweaty Jeremiah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I didn't see it as a but, well. I was like, I was like, in my head, I've never heard of yeah. this slang anywhere. Uh, like, what's up, Sweaty? I was just scanning the page and I just saw honey and sweaty and I thought it was like, yeah. probably like, I don't know. Okay. I guess not point out. Point out the way they look. Yeah. I'm clarifying that for you. To be honest with you, I was bugging the hell out of you. Yeah, that's all right. So, so I'm going to want to call him Mr. Flores. Um, or if they have a, a difficult last name, sir, can I, is there another name? I, I'm afraid I'm going to mess up that last name. You know, can I, can I call you by Caleb? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I do sir and ma'am a lot. <laughs> all right? Plus, I don't remember, you, know, you guys know, I, I have a hard time with names. And plus, the more I say it, the more I'm going to be likely to remember it. It's really important. So how many of you guys have ever had to go to the hospital? Anybody by ambulance? Let me tell you that it holds completely different water to walk in 
to the nurse and go, uh, this is a 42-year-old chest pain patient, da 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 versus, hey, Kyle, this here is Miss Smith. This is Tracy Smith. She's 42 years old. She's been having chest pain. So she now thinks that, or she now realizes that I see her as a person, not just a chest pain, not just a patient, but you've made it personal. And if you've never been on that side of patient care, you won't understand the value of it. Okay, it is very important to at least put on your Oscar-winning smile, okay, and 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 let them know that you think of them, or let them feel like you think of them as a person. This is the you know this is the example I use when we start talking about dealing with people. How many of you guys have stepchildren? We're a stepchild. We're in a blended family in any way, shape, or form. One. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, here's, here's my thought or theory, and see if this makes sense. See if you can kind of connect this. I don't expect anyone to love my children the way I love my children, right? Because it's different. I agree that it's different. If you have kids, you know what I mean, right? You never knew you could love someone or have this kind of attachment or bond to someone until you had your children. Does that make sense? The difference is the stepchild, the foster child, should never know that you don't feel the same way. Right? My kids should all feel like I love them equally. I love them all the same. Step, biologic, foster, I don't care. The difference is only I should know. That's how I should treat people. I care about you as a person. Whether I really do or not, it's not for me to tell him. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? This is all about him feeling like she really does care. Okay? Oh, also, use open-ended questions. Unless. Now, this happens every time. Um, if somebody is having respiratory distress and they are having difficulty speaking, that doesn't mean that they're not alert and that they're not verbal when you do your ABC, your AVPU assessment. If they can't speak because they're having respiratory distress, as long as they're looking at me, they're still alert, okay? They can't talk because of respiratory complaints. That's different, all right? So the only time I'm going to tell you that it's really okay to ask closed-ended questions, yes and no questions, is in that case, when you have somebody that is struggling to breathe, okay? Otherwise, I don't need to go, does it hurt right here? Well, yeah, it hurts right there. Does it go anywhere like here? Yeah, that's where it goes, okay? So with one finger, can you show me where it hurts? Open-ended questions. What does it feel like? Okay, not does it burn? Okay, that's the difference between an open-ended question and a closed question. Everybody get it? Excellent. Clear as mud. Say again? <laughs> Clear as mud. Ma'am. Okay, excellent. So some questioning techniques. So facilitation, to encourage the patient to say more, you're gonna say, go ahead, or I'm listening, right? What else? Reflection, this is kind of repeating um, the patient's words to encourage them to tell me more, okay? Clarification, um, used to clarify basically ambiguous statements or words, so give me an example of clarification. Yeah, so are you saying, you know, or so it started a couple of days ago, but it got worse today. Is that what you're telling me? That's clarification. Okay. Um, empathetic responses. Interpreting feelings and response. Say again. Okay. Empathetic responses. What's an empathetic response? I'm sorry. Okay. Sure. Well, but we're talking about communication here, so how do I? If the situation is, I know what you're going through. Yeah, let's say if you've gone through what they're going through, like a death of a loved one, you okay. can be empathetic, trying to support it, be able to have an emotional Yeah, they were talking about, like, we all got put in the stretcher, and it's all over twice, so when you're putting them in there, it's like, I've, I've been here, I know what it feels like, you know, I'm okay. Okay. Like 
Okay? It could also be, Jerry, I understand that you're sad. And I know that this is probably difficult for you to talk about. Um, are you telling me this? Right? This is kind of validating. So when I do that, don't you think, if I go, I, I understand that you're sad. I can see that. Are you now more willing to talk to me? Because now you feel like she understands me. Right? So this is all part of communication. Okay? Um, <laughs> use confrontation with caution. That's putting it mildly. That's, that's okay? So there are, uh, and I'm not telling you there's not ever going to be a time for you to be, to confront someone about a statement. Or, so, um, prime example, my wife told me she wanted to kill herself. She sat down and go, hey, what's, what's going on today? Jesse, how's it going? How you feeling? And if she don't tell me, go, well, it, your husband says that, that you might have mentioned that you felt like hurting yourself. Is that, is that right? Right? But you don't want to go, your husband said you were going to kill yourself. <laughs> See the difference? Because how many times are they going to go, I just said that because I was mad at him. Okay? Now she's just admitted to saying it. But now there are times that, okay, you got to go with me to the hospital because you said you're going to hurt yourself, right? This is how it works. You have to go with me to the hospital. You don't get to choose anymore. So I'm going to be nice. I'm going to try to persuade you. Okay, go ahead and sit down right here. Well, I'm not ready yet. And, and uh, Okay, you know, I'm going to try to be, there is going to come time I'm going to go, it is time for you to sit down on the stretcher. Right? This is a progressive thing. If you go on a scene and you're acting like that already, you are behind the power curve. Okay? So be very cautious about using that confrontation. Um, and then... Uh, interpretation. So you're saying, okay, how do we interpret? What do we what do we do here? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right. So sample history, and this is important. Sample signs and symptoms. A allergies. I want to know. Now look, this is that open ended question. Okay, open ended questions. Are you allergic to anything, Grana? Versus, are you allergic to medicine? Because if you ask if they're allergic to medicine, what do you think they're going to tell you? Just medicine. Just medicine. Just medicine. Okay? So that very, uh, you know, if you're going to ask very specifically, you need to say, are you allergic to any medicine, foods, you know, environment, whatever. Okay? M, medical, or I'm sorry, medications. Medication is going to be, what do you take? Um, um, this is both over-the-counter herbs, is it yours, your medication, or your wife's nitro, whatever, okay? When did you take it? How often do you take it? Are you taking it like you're supposed to, okay? Some of these type questions. Can I see them? Where are they at? I'm always reluctant to take them with me to the hospital for a couple of reasons. We're pretty fortunate here because if they go to Scott & White, they go to Scott & White all the time, Scott & White's going to have them on file, right? Guess what? If somebody loses those medications, who's buying medications? My company is. Sometimes that can actually come back on you, okay? If you're talking about somebody who's on Medicaid or Medicare, they're only allowed so many prescriptions a month. They're also on a fixed income. It's not like they can go out and, and buy their blood pressure medicine again. Better yet, if they have chronic pain, elderly folks, like say they have a fractured back and they're on chronic pain medicine, they cannot refill their medicine within so many days. They have to wait, okay? That is not being a patient advocate. All right. Um, P, previous medical history pertinent relating to this complaint. So some of this we already talked about, right? This is all kind of what we're going to do. Now, you don't have to ask it in this order. You don't have to ask these specific questions. This is here to guide you to make sure that you cover your bases. And this isn't, by all means, the only questions I need to ask. So each question should lead to another question and another question. We should be conversating, not interrogating our patients. Okay. Um, last oral intake, so food or drinks, like what did you have and when did you, when did you have it, okay? That may or may not be appropriate, and, and I may not ask that until much later. If I think they're going to go to surgery, probably need to know. When's the last time you had anything to eat or drink? Or if they're saying I'm nauseous, ugh. When did you have anything something to drink or eat? And what did you have, right? So we need to be prepared, okay? And then events leading up to the incident, what happened and when? We're going to learn a little bit more. These acronyms, again, are you good? Yeah. Okay. These acronyms. Huh? I asked the same question. Uh, I saw him with his meter, so I wanted to make sure. All right. So, 
Signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to. I promise you must know all of these acronyms. Okay. OPQRST is another one, and this is used for medical again. Or this one is used predominantly for medical. So onset, when and how did it start? Like what were you doing? Oh, you have chest pain, what were you doing when it started? My chest pain started when I was mowing the lawn. Okay. Um, anything make it better or worse? That's provocation or provocation. Okay. Q is quality. How does it feel? What does it feel like? You know, if they if they kind of go, I don't I don't know. You can give them a few options, but don't give them one. Okay. So is it burning, crushing? Feel like a stabbing pain? Because they might not understand what does it feel like. Okay, if you've ever had, and a lot of your chest pain people will say, I don't have pain, it doesn't hurt. Oh, what does it feel like? It's a heaviness, I can't, I can't get a full breath. Okay, be very careful about asking about pain or discomfort or abnormal feelings, okay? Um, yeah, be careful not to lead your patients. Um, R is region or radiation. So if it's abdominal pain, where does it hurt, right? What region of the abdomen is it? versus radiation, if I have flank pain and I say it starts here and you go, if they're holding their back and you go, does it go anywhere? And they go, yeah, it radiates right around to my, to my lower abdomen here. Okay, it's important to know. Um, and then the severity, how bad is it? On a scale of zero to 10, zero is no pain. 10 is the worst pain you've ever felt in your life. Patrick, what number do you give it? 12, oh my gosh, that's horrible. I couldn't imagine, that must hurt a lot, okay? And then time is how long have you had the symptoms. So I know that it started when he was outside mowing the lawn. I know that it started when we were outside mowing the lawn. How long ago was that? How long have you been sitting in this chair? How long ago did you call 911? How long did you wait before you called 911? Okay? What do you mean by don't leave the patient? Yeah, that's that open-ended question. So what is that? You have chest pain? What does that feel like? Jeremiah? Rather than, does it feel like an elephant sitting on your chest? Oh, okay. Okay, that's that open-ended versus closed questions. Okay? Um, and then there's ASPEN, A-S-P-N. Associated symptoms or associated signs or symptoms. So this is other complaints, basically, that they give you. What you'll see a lot of these go together is chest pain and difficulty breathing or respiratory stress. Okay? Pertinent negatives are what you would expect but they don't have them. Pertinent negatives are extremely important. So as we start learning about different medical conditions, I will learn that you know chest pain might be, um, uh, have nausea and vomiting, I might be lightheaded, I might be dizzy, I might have trouble breathing. If I don't have any of those, those are all pertinent negatives. So if I go, you're having chest pain, does it hurt? Or I mean, does it, does it go anywhere? No, it doesn't. Uh, are you having a hard time breathing? No. Are you sick to your stomach at all? Uh-uh. Those are pertinent negatives because that's something I would expect them to have with cardiac chest pain. That's, that's kind of what my question was earlier. Is pertinent negatives the only time that you really want to ask a yes or no question just to make sure you rule out other things yeah. that kind of what yeah. you assume? And this is kind of that. I've asked two or three questions, and now we're kind of at the end of that. Remember, this is a conversation. So... So they might give me more information. I keep asking another question, another question that might lead me to. Okay. All right, some sensitive topics. Alcohol and drugs, physical abuse or violence, um, and then sexual history. Now, this can be for anybody, right? So be very careful about asking drugs or alcohol. It's all about how you phrase your questions. 100% about how you phrase your question. Jesse, do you do any illegal drugs? No. Are you going to tell me? Sometimes. Versus, hey, DeMarco, you use any recreational, you know? You sure you do? Okay. So I use terms like recreational. Or I say, hey, uh, I saw some beer cans in there. How much have you had to drink today? You know, I tell them, I'm not a cop. I'm not here to get you in trouble. Right, uh, but this can this can make a big difference on some of the some of the medicine I need to give you, right? Or if it's a trauma, hey, look, drinking alcohol is going to have a pretty significant effect on a lot of stuff. But I'm going to tell them bleeding, right? For example, 
Because how many people think, oh, alcohol thins your blood? You never heard that? Okay. So, and, and if you kind of phrase it like that, they might be more willing to tell you. But if you go, been drinking, you're not the cops. And they're going to feel like they're being interrogated. It is all about how you conversate. And it, it starts, guys, believe it or not, it starts when you come up and you introduce your, yourself to your patient. That's when you start developing that rapport. Okay? How about sexual history? For who? Um, women, men, pediatrics, kids. Amen. Right, right. Okay. Me? If I'm in the back of an ambulance and I'm having lower abdominal pain, you want to start asking me some questions. You don't think even I'm going to be uncomfortable, and I know why you're asking them. Right? This is not the time to stand over somebody with your arms crossed to ask them. <laughs> to ask them questions. If you're going to ask my 17-year-old about sexual activity, do you think it's a good idea to do so in front of my husband? No. Well, in my house, it's okay. Right? <laughs> but in other people's house, probably not so much. Because they are going to go, she is not sexually active. She better not be. And you're looking like, okay. Uh huh. So make sure you answer or you ask questions in the appropriate environment, too. Okay? Oh, don't kid yourself. Moms do, too. Yeah, so wait until you get the patient in the back of the truck. Be very careful about saying that to a patient, though, especially if the parents can hear you. Because then they're going to go, she doesn't need to ask. You can ask her with me right here. Sure. Well, and that's that's a little, but I'm in their environment. I, I don't go, do you want your parents here when I talk to you? Because what do you think I just said to the parents? And if she says, no, I don't want my parents in here, now what do you think you just did right over here? Yeah, oh yeah. Right, so now, now is she really going to talk to you? Mm -mm. Okay. So, be real careful about how you ask some of those questions. Okay. If it's not pertinent or appropriate, should you be asking? No. no. Okay. Um, some special page, some special challenges. So, how are you going to deal with the patient who's silent? Don't really want to talk. By by silent, I don't think they're meaning. Um, yeah, they're not talking. They're talking. So they're talking about Jose. He's not really going to talk to me. He don't want to tell me a whole lot, right, Jose? So how do I how do I do that? How do I address this? So, how's your day going? I see you're pretty tired. Are you not sleeping all well night? No. Well, how come? What's going on? I'm not talking too long. Really? How many episodes? The whole second season. Last night? So you mean you didn't prepare for class at all? Well, I went to sleep at 6, trying to sleep till like noon or whatever. And then my friend went to sleep at 9. And then he drove home. So you're here on three hours of sleep? What can I do to get you to wake up a little bit here in class? <laughs> it's not working because she's sleeping anyway. Well, you kind of put me on the spot, so I'm awake now. I did. <laughs> I did. But what did I do? I've developed a rapport, and now look. Somebody who hasn't talked the whole class, other than being asleep, right? Sorry. She's, you know, now she's talking to me. And so I personalized with her. I got on her level. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My body language. How's my body language? Versus. I'm charting, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. So are they going to talk to me? No, not at all. Oh, how about those overly talkative patients? Destiny. <laughs> 
In case you haven't figured it out, nobody is immune in this class. <laughs> How do you handle this? You listen, you act like you're intent, you pick what you believe, you because there will be a demand for you to grab You're telling me I kind of need to sometimes get them kind of back on point. So maybe ask some more redirecting questions. Oh, yeah, you did that last night? Hmm. Well, what's the last thing you remember before you got in the car? I mean, you had a busy night. I was studying. Good answer. Actually, no, I was studying with Patrick. Okay, so maybe we need to ask redirecting questions. Okay. Um, Patients with multiple symptoms? Yeah. Well, I know that you have several things going on. What's what prompted you to call me today? Kind of what's what's the big thing going on today? Or if you know your stub toe, zero to ten, how bad does that hurt? Well, it's a it's a seven. Oh, and your respiratory distress. You know, I, you, you said you're having some trouble breathing. What number do you give that? Well, that's the reason I stubbed my toe. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right. There you go. Or how about which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did you get short of breath first or did you have the chest pain first, right? Um, how about if they're anxious? Uh, Jose, come here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So you're going to try to get information from me. Are you ready? Oh my god. Um, <laughs> man, the kids, they aren't listening. Frustrated. <laughs> so, try to figure out what's going on with me today. Um, oh my gosh. Anxiety. Okay, somebody else, somebody else get this. Come on. <laughs> what trying to be doing. Come on. I'll give her a shot. We're acting here. We're, aren't you a drama guy? Oh, God, it's yeah. right. what? Whatever. <laughs> what are you doing here in my house? Well, you, I'm out here calling 911. Are you the one that called me out here? Who? Who called 911? Kids! Get in here! Yes, How's your day been, man? Oh, I'm so angry. Really? Why are you angry? Why did you let me do this? <laughs> 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 yeah, I know you're not right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's because I would probably get sued. Uh, I didn't worry about that. I didn't know you were not angry. So, like, look, you see? You tried to go, right? I, I did, and it, it was that quick, right? Kids, kids, and he followed me, right? I let him right to where I wanted him to go. The door's right there. Yeah, you got this thing over here. I'm all good. All right. So how's he going to deal with that? Yeah, so not. So, so, um, so you be the you be the angry one that's walked off. Let me try this. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if I do it a decent job. Okay. Um. Yeah, Mr. Bowles. Yeah. Hey, come on in here, man. Let's have a seat. Man, I know you're mad, and I, you know what, what I want to hear about here? it. You know, somebody called me here. Why don't you have a seat? We'll talk. Why are y'all here? You know, I'm not real sure, but I was hoping that you could tell me. Did, is something wrong? I don't know. I, you have something on your thumb there. Yeah, I did that earlier while I was working on the truck. Uh, were one of the kids out there with you, maybe? Uh, maybe Tommy. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, you want me to take a look? Tommy's pretty worried about it. That must have been who called me here. Can I take a look at it? Uh, no, I got it wrapped up pretty well. It's well, I see a little bit of blood coming through there, though. Yeah, it keeps leaking. Do you, how about I give you another bandage? Uh, can, can I bandage it for you? I got a good stockpile in the door in there. Okay. You, you want me to go get you one? Uh, sure. He is now not violent. He's sitting. He's cooperative. And I just conversated with him. Right? I mean... Now, if he had continued to be violent, then I would have, you know, kind of took my step back and what do I need to do with my hands, right? Yeah, see that, look, this is kind of the whole, hey, look, right, the guy who's not wanting to fight, it's like, man, I'm, 
I'm okay. just here. I'm, I'm just here. <laughs> They're probably going to put it away. It's going to be cold. I'm going to get a hot plate. Oh, I know what you mean. She made me so mad, and I smashed my thumb, and all she could do is go, you smashed your thumb? Holy cow, let me look at that. Okay? All right. Um, the first one, I was trying to be intoxicated. Jose, you weren't even getting my story. And I kept drinking my drink. And I kept drinking my drink. And I kept drinking my drink. And she's sad. There's some rum in here. She's sad. She's sad. All right. Um, what about the limited, limited cognitive ability? What does cognitive ability mean? It's a brain. Yeah, cognitive ability. That's my thought process. How do I deal with the mild mental retardation? Absolutely, don't use big words. Really. Yeah, and you're going to find, prime example, I had a woman. Now, she called me out for vaginal bleeding about once a month, conveniently. And you know, don't laugh, that's not a joke. <laughs> and and I would go, oh, you're, you're bleeding? Yeah, I think I'm miscarrying. Oh, well, when was your last normal menstrual cycle? It was about a month ago. Okay, all right. Um, how, how, you know, how much are you bleeding right now? When do you change your pads? What do you think you told me? I don't. When it gets full. <laughs> After I get out of the shower and stuff. Okay, well, how long? Like, how many of you use today? So I have to rephrase my question. Right? If they don't understand the question I'm trying to ask, what do they say? Um, what is it that doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome? That's insanity, right? You know what they say? Insanity is asking the same question and expecting a different answer. Right? If they don't understand, the only thing isn't going to hear and asking the same question, how can you change your bag when it's full? I don't understand what you're asking me. Right? Um, language barrier. We may need to get the interpreter, and it is okay for family, but we talk about the family we use. I think we talked about this already, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, hearing impaired. Don't try and sign language. Yeah, you don't. Mm -hmm. I'll say them. So, how am I going to do them different if they can look directly at them when you're speaking? How about stay in their direct line of sight, right? Or if they're hard of hearing, low tone. You don't have to shout, but lean in and get a little closer and not see it well. Okay? Sure. Um, visual impairment. <clears throat> Tell them everything you're doing. I couldn't imagine not being able to see and just hearing things around me. Wouldn't that scare the daylights out of you? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now we're at the secondary assessment. You know what? Here we go on. <laughs> 